Hello, everybody. Today is April 5th, 2024. And as you can see on the screen, I have something to bring forth about the friends of God today and that they are very, very special people of the Lord. I have been sitting over time wanting to know more about the friends of God because at his wedding banquet, at his nuptials, he has friends of the bridegroom. That's a very specific of the bridegroom. Didn't necessarily say friends of the bride, but it did say of the bridegroom, the bride and the guests. And then it does talk about those who try to sneak in another way, um, but we're not even addressing those today. <laughs> Climbing in another way without a garment proper, right? Those are those in estrangement. Those are those that have been working ways of spiritual workings like New Age, without the truth, not coming through the door, which is very, very sad because they actually know how to function in the spirit realm. And the body of Christ really, for the most part, does not know how to be a spirit being with the Lord in proper alignment. We are a spirit being. You'll never stop being a spirit being. It's just which kingdom do you represent? Because that's the one you'll represent for all of eternity at some point. And this realm is the little in-between period between we were always with God on the other side and this tiny lifetime here that is like an eyelash blowing in the wind of eternity. And then we're going back into eternity with God or forevermore. Whatever you do in this lifetime, whatever you do in your account of the body you are given, each man will give an account for what he has done in his body, which kingdom he has aligned with and whom he chose to serve this day and every day and for all of eternity. We'll find out after this blink of time is over for each and every one of our lives. And so I say it, meditating and dwelling and chewing on who are the people that are coming to this wedding because a wedding is a uniting. It's like, an, it's like the official uniting, right? Because truthfully, when you are engaged to someone, you have already chosen to be united, but you haven't gone through the formality of it, right? So there's a formality of it. However, essentially, we all have to become wise virgins or wise engaged ones to him in this lifetime. It's full on engagement with the spirit of the living God in truth, in love, in authenticity, these things have to be upheld. He has to literally be upheld. Your inner man has to literally choose to function as he functions and become one with him and be reformed back into his image. Because when we enter this place, this blink of time, this eyelash blowing in the wind of eternity, it's so tiny of an amount of time. When we entered into this realm, we entered malformed. We came perfected from him. We entered here malformed. Because the sin nature was upon us at that point, the brokenness. In this time frame, our job is to come back into unity with him. Our whole purpose of why we're here is, will you come back to me in the time I gave you of your own free will or not? And this is who I am. Scripture describes the I am, who he is. So he offers himself, describing to everyone who he is. And do you wish to be as I am, where I am? right? So if we, if we wish to be as he is, where he is, and with him again, then you will be as he is. You will be reformed. In this lifetime, you will undergo a reformation process to some degree, but his hope is to full maturity, as every parent hopes that their child matures into a fully functional adult. That's a fully functional adult according to his standard and who he is. So there's a massive reformation process that has to undergo in this lifetime our souls by free will, which means you will put your full effort into returning to be his image. That is part of the sanctification walk. The works of salvation themselves were done and finished by him. Salvation is an open door to unite to him again. That's it, folks. As you come through that door... You and he take each other's hand in a marriage and you're reformed by his hand. Your whole person is repentant, which means a total change in thinking completely. And you become the new creation in Christ, with Christ, by his hand of reformation. 
That's your sanctification walk in this lifetime. Admitting he is Savior and he is God is just a handshake. You have to keep, you have to keep your fruits unto repentance, what you produce in this life, which is your comes from your actions. So your actions have to produce a result, a product that looks like him, sounds like him, walks like him, and is as he is. That is the totality of returning to him fully. People often want to know the difference between outer court, inner court, or even, excuse me, there was a little bug on me. Sorry, little bug. I had just come in from outside. Many people want to know the difference between outer court, inner court, and holy of holies. The outer court is very, very carnal. So the people that enter in to the kingdom of God in the end will enter in at all different phases, some by the skin of their teeth. That's the outer court people who, to whatever degree, fit that qualification. They lived more carnally in this lifetime with more strongholds, more oppression, and more formed like his enemy still, or the unreformed, un repentant, unsanctified man. I don't know what the limitations are on that, and I don't want to know, but I do know that he works in mercy and grace, and I do know that his desire is that no man would stay in that place, because technically what he has told me is when you enter back into heaven, you into where God's domain is, you enter back into God. And so can you imagine if you had, if the, if the, if the Holy of Holies is his heart, and if the inner court is like his abdomen itself, lungs, you know, uh, stomach, gut area, all of that, right? But if the Holy of Holies is like his mind and his heart, the deepest places in him where he functions, and you had to reside just under the skin, just under the surface of God, and you couldn't enter into those spaces where his spirit is in fullness, I think each and every one of us would regret the way that we lived in this time frame that we were given that is a an, an eyelash blowing in the breeze of eternity. It's so very tiny, small. It's so very little to give up for him in order to be with him forevermore where he is in his fullness. Not everybody will, will, will be able to access that on the other side, immediately access him directly in his presence. Not everyone will serve him in the throne room. Those are the priests of the Lord. And in that, you have the difference between the outer court and the inner, inner court, the holiest place of all. In between is a place where people came into the Lord, came into the Reformation process, did not say no to it, but did not overcome to the extent that they could have becoming one with him, really going through the refining fires in every way, willingly analyzing themselves to come into unity with him in every way possible in their thinking, in their attributes of what they express through their person, in their controlled emotional sta status, like as he is, and fruiting that out and walking as one where they are constantly nonstop in communion with him all day long. And they have poured out their souls unto death and it is not them that lives anymore, but Christ in them where two have become one. Their vessel is fully indwelled by God, and there is a difference. That's the inner, most holiest place that you can be with God. So depending on what you enter into in this life will secure your position on the other side, and in the millennial reign, and on the new earth. It's really important for us to take our lifetime that we've been given here as a gift very seriously in this realm, because how you enter into the others, because he said, I'm, I'm just. Do you think that if somebody gave me everything, laid down their life entirely in this lifetime, was persecuted to the hilt, refined to the hilt into my image, and I indwelled them versus the persons who did not do that, that they would have the same access to me on the other side immediately or access to the same things, the same, the same activities with me? Absolutely not. I am just. My balances are equal. My son, Yeshua HaMashiach, gave everything to me. And he is seated at my right hand. All authority put in him. So everybody that is actually in him, 
in deep relationship with him who has become like as my son, who has become the Melchizedek order of pure priests unto me, serving my needs in the earth, allowing me to do my work through them because they have been refined into my image. That is a very different company of people that I will do much more through with my great exploits of faith versus the people on the outer court or versus the people who have entered into the inner court but would not pay the cost in this lifetime to be a friend of God. That's the difference, Janet, between Abraham and Enoch and those who will just enter in by the skin of their teeth into the outer court because they were unwilling to be reformed in a massive way, which would be the inner court. And they were unwilling to go all the way with me which would be the holiest place where now they look like the high priest. See, many people don't want to talk about priests, Janet. They want to talk about child of God, even friend of God, even, even just walking out as a manifested son. What they don't want to talk about is being priestly because it is an absolute requirement to serve me in my throne where, where, where I am priestly as a high priest forevermore in the inner in, in the innermost holiest place of of the court the throne room itself these are they who are serving me in the throne room now in the earth it is why they'll have access and it is why the outer court people will have the pleasures of heaven nature the animals the communion with others walking in those spaces and they will be fulfilled to a degree in that alone but that's the difference between having to make an appointment to to have time with me in whatever format that is that is in the throne room or or serving me day and night in my throne room everywhere I am you are you are never without me because that's what you lived in this lifetime giving up everything you could have had in this world to live your own life your own way was given up and the cost was paid that's the difference so when I talk about my friends of God Janet they are a very specific company and branch of my people. They are the order of Melchizedek and they are the leadership in that because many are called to be kings and priests, but many are still going to be in a disciplined practice of learning what is that and where they are not measuring up to that because a standard has been set and the standard is my son and with him, all things are possible. So let's talk about who is making excuses and who's not, who says with Christ, I can do all things because he's strengthening me to do so. I'm not looking for no infractions ever. I'm looking for a serious effort here with a full on desire that you have no other desire, but me. Those are the friends of God. That is why Enoch pleased me and was no more. That is because he transcended. That is because he transfigured. That is because we, he and I became one and he pleased me. You were made for my pleasure. So those who please me are friends of God. And he's telling me with that to go forward in this. The friends of God, they are a very special people of the Lord. I have been inquiring of the Lord for quite some time off and on about the difference between the bride, the friends of the bridegroom, and the guests of the wedding for quite some time. The guests, I think we can understand as they are all acquaintances, meaning they are there. They have been invited to, to the wedding of the lamb. Excuse me, let me put this in editing mode again. But they did not qualify to be the one wedding him in that they desired not to be one with him. This is the purpose of marriage. I believe they are those who chose him as savior, but not, not to be one with him in this lifetime. Very important. He said that you understand that the ones who are marrying him want to be married to him, but they have not chosen to be the, to be one with him in this lifetime in all ways, all the way. And so what he tells me from this, right, we're talking about the guests, the, the acquaintances who have been who have been asked to come into life with God, but were not willing to come out of the carnality to the degree that they would even be the bride. Those are the skin of the teeth people to get in. 
And the bride, he tells me, as I'll highlight this down here, I'll skip down just a little bit. There are those who clearly desire to become one with him and to join him in covenant. But, but he said to me, but they did not come into full on maturity in this lifetime, paying the full cost all the way. So on the other side, they will finish marrying him on the other side in a maturation process, as well as becoming one in a formal procedure, like a formal nuptials. But you see, I wanted to know more about these friends of his. Who are they and why are they essentially? Because he said, but who are these friends and why does he call himself a friend? And I said, he began to speak to me through a Neville Johnson video a bit. And then he began to flesh it out for, for me even more so. And then there's a hyperlink in here, which is in my document, but I will, I will put that in the document for the blog as well. Because he wants us to have that link to see more, because I'm not going to go into everything that Neville did. Because his friends, even though when we read the scripture about the friends, and we read the scripture about the bride, and we read the scripture about the guests, he said, I don't think they understand who the friends are and why they're so special. So he would like to explain why they are not just the bride. Because a bride is someone who joins themselves to the Lord. The friends have done that in this lifetime. Friendship is so much more than what we can fathom to God. And he tells me he has so very true friends. And essentially his friends will help him bring his bride into proper relations with him and will help her to scrub her garments, become purified in odor pleasant to him, assist the bridegroom. And, and I'm going to highlight that because you notice that it doesn't say friends of the bride and bridegroom. It says friends of the bridegroom because these will assist the bridegroom in all he has need of for the time of his nuptials with his bride and will remain in close workings with him to accomplish all of this. Essentially, his friends already married him, becoming one with him, and will help prepare a people of the Lord for the Lord with the intimate union fruit produced in marriage relationship that they acquired in this realm. That's the inner man. So the rest of his bride-to-be is ready when he returns to receive her. Friends of God are one with him, having completed marriage union with him now, producing a child with him already, a man-child. And they will nourish the woman, his wife-to-be, in the wilderness of their lives, where they are to become refined and in union with him and this truth as well. His friends were once known as the servants of the Lord only. They are priests. But now these are called his friends. For all he has of the Father has now been made known to them. Oneness achieved, mature and full stature of Christ erect within them. And they go to prepare a people for him as he himself leads them, doing the Father's works, workings through them. And this is John 15. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman, every branch in me that bears not fruit. So when he says this, when he says, I'm the true vine, he's the tree. That's the tree of life. And the father is the one who prunes anything that is not of as like same, period. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes it away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. He said, please highlight that. Every branch that bears fruit is somebody who's trying to be serious with the Lord in this lifetime to become one with him. And every branch that does produce the fruit of that union, he'll purge you. He'll cut you back. He'll refine you even more. He'll chop off more things that are not meat for the kingdom of God in your life so that you can produce even greater, so that you can ascend the mountain higher. Now you are clean or purified through the word, which I have spoken to you. He said, I think that they think that just because they have the word, that that means they're already clean. He said, no, this is how you're cleaned. You are cleaned and purified through the word, which I have spoken to you. So that means that something has to take place with the word inside of man. 
abide, which means stay in a given state, a relation or expectancy. So that that's a duty. Abide in a given state, a relation and expectancy. Continue, dwell, endure, be present, remain, stand and tarry in me. That those are actions that are required and die in you because that because then he is going to remain in his given state in relation to you and continue and dwell and endure and be present and remain and stand and tarry with you if you're going to abide in him which is what go go above this again that you're being cleaned and purified by the truth of the word of the scripture the truth is getting into you and changing you entirely remaining in that to what roll back up janet so that whatever you are bearing of fruit, you will continue to bear more as he continues to cleanse, purify you and clean you up, bringing you into more maturity, ascending the mountain of God or ascending deeper into God. Hence the difference between outer court, inner court and deepest, the holiest of holy places. The holiest of holy places are for those who became the holiest of holy with him in this earth, shedding the entire flesh nature to every ability that they possibly could returning to his image in this lifetime. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide or stay in the given state in relationship or expectancy, continuing dwelling, enduring, being present, remaining, standing and tarrying in the vine. So you're not going to be able to bear fruit at all unless you're attached to the vine, which is attached to the truth and the truth attached to you rooted and grounded. No more can you bear his fruit, except you abide, stay in a given state, in relationship, continue, dwell, endure, be present, remain, stand, and tarry in him. He is the truth. I'm the vine. You're the branches. So we have to be attached to him, attached to, right? Rooted and grounded in the truth, and the truth rooted and grounded in you. No hypocrisy, authenticity. And he's looking and searching the hearts, and he knows best we know whether we're entertaining darkness and compromise or if we're wholehearted and we're producing fruit and we're being refined more and more by the day to look more and more like him by the day, to resemble more and more of him, to pay the cost and to return to his image into a full stature of Christ erected in us. He who abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit for without me, you can do nothing. If a man abides not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide, my truth abides, stays in a given state in relationship with it, continuing dwelling, enduring and being present and remaining and standing and tarrying in you, you shall then ask what you will and it'll be done to you. A lot of people want to ask a lot of things, assuming it's going to be done unto them, but they do not walk sanctified lives with God consecrated unto him where the word of truth abides in them and is rooted and grounded. They do not stay in Christ and Christ is not fully indwelling them. That's the problem. The word of God can be upheld when the kingdom of God is upheld, when the dominion of God inside a vessel is upheld. Without that, we're in compromise and we're in dark ways still. We are estranged in many ways from God. We are a double-minded man and unstable in all our ways. Which kingdom does he uphold? Herein is my father glorified or in this my father is glorified that you would bear much fruit so you shall be my disciples. So now he says, if you're going to bear much fruit, then you can be his disciples, right? Or if you're going to be his disciples, flip it. If you're going to be disciplined ones under him, that's the way you'll bear much fruit. No, undisciplined will never do that. Undisciplined to what, Janet? The truth being rooted and grounded in you and love. Without the truth and love, which is mercy, right? Without the truth and mercy being rooted and grounded in you, which is love, you're not abiding in the spirit. You are a spirit. If you're coming, if you have the truth and you're beating people over the head with it, you're a spirit, but you're not of his spirit in that. Because in order to actually be living the truth, you would be working out of love. And love is very patient and long suffering and merciful. As the father has loved me, so have I loved you. So continue in my love, continue in my love. And if you keep my commandments, that's how you'll abide in my love. Even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. So how did he tell us that we can stay in the love of God? Abiding in his love. We have to keep his command in our lives, the command of his precepts of what he has put forth for how we live. The truth and mercy, the truth, mercy and truth rooted and grounded in it. Mercy and love. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy. Now he clarifies it. His, his joy or his cheerfulness and delight should remain in us and then our joy 
or cheerfulness and delight may be full. In what? If we keep his commandments and we abide in his love, which is keeping his commandments, it's obedience to him and returning to his image. That is what will give him joy. And he'll remain in us, that his joy will then remain in us because he's well pleased with us. And so then we'll, we'll be fulfilled in joy as well. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. And then we have to look at our lives and go, am I loving people like how Jesus does? He is serious about this. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. His dear ones, his fond ones, his friendly, that's the strongs. His friends are dear to him. He is fond of them and they are friendly one to the other. If you will lay down your life for him, then you can be your his friend. If you are my friends, you are my friends. If you do whatever I command you, boom, friends are different than bride or guests because friends will do everything and anything he commands. That's the difference between outer court, inner court, and holiest of holy places in the throne room where his presence resides at all times. Henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant knows not what his Lord does, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my father, I have made known unto you. And he wanted this highlighted for a reason, because he said his friends, he'll reveal everything to them. And everything he's ever heard of his father will be made known to us, not told to us. We'll know it. It'll become alive in us and we'll walk in it. He will make it known to his friends because there's a cost. They gave up everything they could have had in this lifetime for a carnal life of their own to just be reunited to him and walk as he is with him. That's all. He's their prize. That's a special caliber person. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go forth. You should go and bring fruit forth fruit. That your fruit should remain. That whatsoever you shall ask of my father in my name, he may give it to you. To whom? To whom? Friends. Friends. His friends. We didn't choose him first. He chose us, but we chose back. We chose back and he ordained us from the beginning. What? To be friends of God. That is what his true goal is with all of us. Do you know you can marry someone and not be their friend? Or they not be your friend. You can have a brother, family relation, a sister, and they're not your friend. His goal with all of us is to be as close, closer than a brother, a friend. This is something we need to really take heed of in here. And he says that those people, whatever those people will ask in his father's name, he'll give it to you because you have been chosen and ordained and that you're going forth, bringing forth fruit, and your fruit is remaining. Huge to know. To his friends who remain in him, abiding, tarrying with his words, alive in them who adhe adhere to his every command, who walk in true love, laying down their lives for their brethren. That's his friends. These things I command you, that you love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world, but because I have chosen you, out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my sayings, they will keep yours too. He said, please highlight that because something else I want to tell you about this is if I was a friend of the father and you're in me, you have the ability to be a friend of the father too, but you have to walk the walk of sonship that I walked. Keep the sayings that he keeps, keep his word. Keep his command and leadership in your life. But all these things will they do to you for my name's sake, because they know not him who sent me. They don't know the father of love and of truth. If I had not come and spoken to them, they had not or would not have had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. It means that he revealed the difference between himself and them. The difference between sinlessness and sin. And now they have no covering for it. They're not ignorant anymore. Once we're brought into the truth and we are not ignorant anymore. And we know what darkness is. You don't get to play with it anymore. He who hates me hates my father also. Which would really mean he who hates the truth and love will also hate me. 
the truth and love. Meaning they're not going to uphold it in this lifetime or in their person. If I had not done among them the works which no other man did, then they had not or would not have had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. What he's saying is because he came and showed them the difference that he did works. As the beginning of that sentence before the highlighted says, if I had not come amongst them and did what no other man could do, but he did. So he came and he showed the difference between righteousness and unrighteousness, sinlessness and sin and transgression against God. So now, now because of that, they know they have sinned. And so now they, they have both seen and hated both the truth and love. That's sad. That's the worldly spirit and the people thereof, because this comes to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. How do you hate love, mercy, and laying down your life for someone in truth? Meaning you really, truly love them in that way and you'd give anything for that. How do you hate that, right? They hated him without a cause. But when the comforter is come, whom I will send you from the father, even the spirit of truth, which proceeds from the father, he shall testify of me. And you also shall bear, shall bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Folks, you know who his friends are? They're going to be those who have not only been there with him from the beginning, but remain. Those who endure to the end shall be saved. Listen saved paying the full cost gets you into the holiest of holy places but are we willing to pay that cost are you willing to die in every way shape and form that that you're con currently conducting yourself not as he is he's not going to force you he'll tell you and show you the way he will point you to the way he will show you in scripture who he is and how he operates but he'll force no man Friendship, G5373, is fondness, friendship. Fondness, the definition, is affection or liking for someone or something. So do we have affection and actually like who he is? I mean, really, you like, you're not just saying I like you because you're my father and you died for me. You like how he operates so much so that you want to be that. And synonyms are, are you affectionate toward him? Are you loving toward him? Are you liking him? Are you warm toward him? Not turned off, not estranged, not repulsed. Are you tender toward him? Are you kind toward him? Have you devotion toward him? Do you care? Are you, in, are you sharing endearment toward him? Do you have feelings of sentiment toward him? Attachment, closeness, friendliness. Are you familiar with him? Are you intimate? Do you regard him? Do you respect him? Do you admire him, adore him, and worship him with reverence? Do you have a taste for him and righteousness? Are you partial to him? Do you prefer him? Are you keen? It means like single eyed on him with inclinations and a penchant and a predilication, a predilication, predilic, a predilection <laughs> and a fancy relishing a passion for him. That's friendship with God. And that's what God displayed to us when he said there is no greater love than a friend lay his life down, than a man lay his life down for his friends. That's what he did. Because that's the definition of fondness is everything he thinks of you. Do we give that back? Friendly H, 3820. It's the heart. So friendly comes from your heart. The center of you is friendly. Feelings, your will, your intellect, friendly. The center of you to care for, consider, be merry, kind, in regard of, and in wisdom. That's what it is to be friendly one to another. Proverbs 18, 24, a man who has friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother or a relation, brethren. And that's the definition in Strong's. Family is just that. They are not always for you. They are not always in accord with you, but they are family. The house of God is often like this, but a friend is another type of companion altogether. A friend will stick tight. A friend will support. A friend will be in unity. A friend will defend. A friend will lay down his life just to make sure you are loved, cared for, in all ways, safe, secure, and your needs are met. Family does not always do this. Brethren do not always do this. Friends move from the heart of God. Family doesn't always do that. Our Lord is one who sticks closer than a brother or family relation. And for this reason, he is our friend. He gave all for us 
and those whom he considers in the category of friend will give all to him and toward all the others like he did and does. He showed himself friendly, no competition, no jealousy, no having to prove his status or being right. He simply loved and preferred all over himself. And because of this, he has friends, people who love him and give their all as well. It is reciprocated or requited love. A friend loves and loves well and fully. Exodus 33, 11, And the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend one associated with a companion, a husband lover. Here we see that the Lord's friends are close to him. They are partners in this lifetime, companions. They are his lovers. And in this, we see his friends know him and are known of him face to face. Family isn't, isn't always in this status. Second Chronicles 20, verse 7. Are you not our God who did drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the gave it to the seed of Abraham, your friend forever. And friend here in this instance is H157, to have affection for sexually or otherwise, be love, loved, lovely, lover, friend. Here we see that the seed of Abraham, those of faith in God, are his friends. They are those who walk the walk they talk with God. True believers, devout, resolute, and committed and here he equates consummation of relationship, affection. That means true coupling, marriage, covenanting with the living God in this realm, in true love, which is born of obedience to his word, that's authentically living it, and to his command in their lives, according to the precepts he has set forth to live in and from. This is equated with two becoming one, enjoined a married couple in this world and lifetime. To be love, loved, lovely, or lover equals a friend of God. So, essentially, those who join him in this world, in this lifetime, consummate that relationship as a bride, here and now, where two become one, now, are the friends of God, fully mature man-child of the Lord God. And the fully mature man-child of the living God will bring in the maturation of the immature, the filthy, wrinkly bride of Christ for his coming as a people prepared for the Lord. The friends of the bridegroom are his lovers, his servant, child, friendly with him, close entwined ones who will serve his needs in the earth and help prepare for him, with him a people of the Lord prepared to marry him as well. You see, many are waiting to marry him on the other side, but you see some are unwilling to wait to be joined to him on the other side and believe you can be with one with him now and are, and are not shy about their affection for him in the proper terms and conditions, obedience, proper love in upholding the truth, the way to walk in that truth here in this realm and the spirit realm doing real relationship union to the truth. And in this, they have entered fully into eternal life now already and they will be his loyal priesthood who attend to his needs for his wedding helping him to prepare his bride those who will join him too the friends have already wed to his truth his person his conduct character nature demeanor as disciplined ones in love to the king of righteousness who loyally defend the truth in their lives are scrubbed clean pure and sanctified in their consecrated lives to him and now because of this union that has taken place transcending time and space they are the friends of god in whom he has affection and fondness care and dedication to who abide in him and he in them they are one the bride has not accomplished this yet, and many will only accomplish this later on. And it will be the friends of God who will serve him, serve his nuptial day necessities, serve his bride to assist her for this union and celebration. They will help her to scrub her garments clean, to be received of her bridegroom, the same, getting ironed out, cleaned up, and sanctified, smelling of the right odors in her purification process, so that she is in proper attire, cleanliness conduct prepared and ready to be received of him the friends of the bridegroom have already married him and they seek to bring others into that union with him as well and help them prepare to do so job six fourteen, to whom to him who is afflicted pity kindness piety reproof beauty and mercy shown from his friend but he forsakes the fear of the almighty 
Here we see that a true friend shows pity to those who are afflicted, to those who have lost fear of the Almighty, which in this instance in Strong's is the moral reverence of the Lord. Moral reverence is to live right as God lives and walking in a way that honors the Lord. This is why his friends will pioneer with him as first of first fruits to help him with his afflicted bride, the one that are to marry him as well, as they show true pity for them which means kindness, piety, reverence for God, or devout fulfillment of religious obligations through reproof, showing beauty and mercy to them, which is helping them to regain the fear of the Almighty or the moral reverence they have been devoid of walking in, the robe of righteousness they have been given, on the ancient paths of righteousness. The mature ones, the man-child birthed, will nourish the woman in the wilderness or in the stripping and wrestling out of the righteous walk with God coming into maturity. Don't wait for some day or after here to marry him and become one with him or to honor his ways in person or to walk his paths of righteousness resolutely and reverently as his friend. For it has eternal consequences of very good things to serve him and to be close in fondness as his friend whilst living in this earth and in time. He calls many, but few are chosen to be this with him, for few choose to be this with him as he is where he is. Proverbs 17, 17. And he said, please note when we get here that 17 is the number for victory. So if you want to know how to have victory, victory, here it is. A friend loves at all times, and a brother or relation and kindred is born for adversity or tightness, trouble, rival, distress, and tribulation. So a friend will love at all times. If you want to be a friend of God, you will learn to walk in the truth, but you will learn to walk in the truth in love, which is mercy and long-suffering and patience and grace. Because not always will kindred or relation or the brethren do this. A brother is born for adversity or to make trouble, to distress, and to bring tribulation. Meaning there will be opposition. It is key that we understand what God's definition of love is. It's obedience and honor to living the truth, becoming living epistles of God's standard of righteousness. Walking therein the, there in the truth upon the paths upon the paths of authentic, not hypocritical, real, not feigned or intellectual knowledge of him, literal, consummated, joined relationship to the truth and impurity of. If we do not understand that to walk in his love is to obey his truth, word, person, ways, and have no shadow of turning from this, excuse me, he's saying, then you do not understand love. God's love. Sorry, God. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> or true love. This is him correcting me in midstream, folks. Those who have done this with him, who walk as he walks, are those who have laid down the soul life to him as he did to the Father, and who seek to only serve the Father's good pleasure, his will, in this temporal earth realm of time and space, to go forth and seek and to save with him that which has been lost to the natural mind, the minding of the carnal and the oppression of the devil ways and afflictions of in this lifetime. These are the friends of God. Proverbs twenty two eleven. He who loves pureness of heart and the grace of his lips, the king is his friend. Pureness of heart and a friend above in the definitions was one of the heart was one of the definitions definitions of friend heart purity. And here we can see that one who walks in purity of heart toward God, the truth and the ways of righteousness will have grace upon their lips. They there's they speak. With honor toward the God of righteousness and holiness and the witness of the kingdom of God. And these bear the product or the pro, the product or produce of the intimate union with the truth, righteousness, love, and holiness, and the product of that union is 
bears the fruit of the Spirit in their lives. These are friendly or closely and fondly associated with, tied in union with, and have become the duplicate image of the Lord God holy. These are the friends of the Lord in the land of the living who have given themselves wholly to him. They serve him, his ways, his truth, and his people, and from love. <coughs> Proverbs 20, 27, 6 and 9. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Ointment and perfume rejoice the heart. So does the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. Here we see that a temporary wounding in reproof that a friend may bring in his counsel brought forth from the word of truth and the spirit thereof may sting for a moment, but... Worse is it to see one coupling with the dark spirit nature being supported by the devils kissed as they entice one to walk in pride, their attributes and principles. The enemy is truly the carnal nature, the natural mind and ways we walk contrary to God as his opposition to his nature ways in person. It is like ointment to our souls and perfuming of sweetness to be reproved in the counsels of a godly man who serves the Lord, the truth and the way in love. Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. It takes iron to sharpen iron. This means it takes one who is one with God, his truth, his ways, and his person to sharpen another in the house of God who has gone dull. This would be strayed, fallen back, backslidden, etc. It will take one who has stayed the course with God, kept his ways, and remains loyal to the king who will be able to see with discernment move with love and bring the enlightenment to those who have gone dull light to those who have gone dark this is what a friend does and this is what the friend of god does toward the brethren or the family this is what yeshua did toward the father and family members when raising the disciplined ones according to father's ways countenance is one's inner man's ways and person so the only one who would be able to do this for one who has gone dull or dark in their ways is that one is like same as the lord god walking in the light as he is in the light these are the fond ones of god his friends who have consummated a marriage already with him in the land of the living who seek to serve him in his pursuit of seeking and saving that which has been lost to darkness song of solomon and excuse me, but I did not put the verse in here <laughs> for summer. His mouth or taste, language, speech, and kiss, most sweet. Yes, he is altogether lovely or delightful, affectionate in desire and pleasant. This is my beloved, my boiling love friend. And this is my friend, O oh, daughters, apple of my eye, branch and company of children of Jerusalem, the place meaning founded peacefully. We are to be a sweet-smelling aroma to the Lord God, a sweet smell to his nostrils as he takes us in. And he is delightful, affectionate in desire for us and pleasant to us, which is pleasing. So the fully mature ones, the friends of the Lord, the man-child product of sweet union with God himself will be well-pleasing to the Lord. We are, after all, created to be pleasing to him. We are created for his pleasure. These are they who please God, like Enoch and Abraham, a friend of God. These are they who are in godly order restored fully, which is peace, founded in godly order or shalom and peace, a company of his children who are the apple of his eye and called friend of God. Isaiah 41, 8, you, Israel, are my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. The true people of faith, Abraham, Jacob, Israel, are servants of the Lord, Melchizedek order or company of priests, holy and pure as he is, walking clean in his righteous robe and ironed out, the man-child company of first fruit union. These are the chosen ones set apart as the friends of God. Luke fourteen ten, But when you are bidden or called, go and sit down in the lowest or contiguity, the state of bordering or being in direct contact with something, and the root is as touching. Be in the lowest room or condition of opportunity and position. That sounds humble. That when he who bade or called you comes, he may say to you, friend, dear one, fond one, my associate, go up, ascend farther, be promoted, take an upper and honorable seat higher, then you shall have worship. 
glory, very apparent in dignity in the presence of those who sit at meat or company with at a meal at the table with you. Many are called, few are chosen. When we are called, do we go into the most humble position serving the interests of God and the brethren first? Do we enter into a state of our souls poured out unto death to serve the interests of the whole? Or do we serve the interests of the self-identity, the self-needs, fed first? Desires are still important above being stripped and giving to others and God first. Are we in direct contact with the spirit of truth, love, and sacrifice, mercy, forgiveness, and giving as ones walking in contiguity who are one with God, who have touched and unified in an opportunity of position and condition? Because when the one who called us comes, he will, will he be able to say to you, friend, my dear one who is fond of me, my truth, my ways and paths, ascend up. Ascend further up my mountain of intimacy. Know my person more intimately. Take an upper and honorable seat with me as I am seated at the right hand of our Father, the Father in whom you also have become one with again, and it is because you have worship to me and are in my glory. And it is very apparent, showing manifesting upon you as you carry my dignity abroad in the presence of those who sit at meat or company with you at the table. You see, many will sit at the table of the Lord, partaking with him, seated at the wedding banquet of God. But there are a select company, a chosen branch or company of people who are known as the friends of God. And these will carry his glory and it will be manifest and apparent upon them. These, they are those who have learned to bow low, give up all, walk authentically in the truth, resolutely in his ways, character, fruits, attributes, love and mercy toward all. And because of this walk, they have ascended into oneness with God, both now and forever. They hold a position or a room with God in closeness of proximity to the Almighty. That would be the throne room, the priests who attend to him day and night. And it was established in the earth realm. As now, it is not they who live in their vessels unto their own lives, but Christ who now lives in them, who serves the interests of the Father in this realm, doing his will which is his good pleasure, plans, agenda, and works, and they pleased the Lord and bless him with their lives. He is just. What a man sows, he will reap. And these have sown it all unto God holy, and in that he will recompense them their reward. He comes, and he with him his reward. He is their reward and their portion, and they have won the prize. These are they who will go forth and do great exploits with their God for they for. Their God and they are one, and he will do his works through them. And these are they who will help prepare a people of the Lord for the Lord with the Lord. For these desire all to become one with him as they are. This is true love, and this is true sacrifice and service, washing the feet of our Lord as he washes us clean. John three twenty nine, He who has the bride, one to marry, a veiled betrothed, is the bridegroom, but the friend or the fond and dear ones of the bridegroom who stands or abides is appointed, continuing in covenant, established, upheld for standing, and hears, gives an audience, and hearkens unto and understands him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice, his disclosure, his tone, his address, and his language, the sound of him. In this, my joy or delight, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who has the bride is our Lord, meaning she is made for him to be united to him. The friends have done this in this lifetime and go to help prepare the others in their wildernesses as well. Their trials and temptations to unite with the Lord in truth in their lives to become one with him as well. But you see, a bride is veiled yet to marry, but is betrothed to be. What does this mean? A friend is already one shown friendly to God, and they have laid their lives down. No greater love is there but that a man lay down his lives for his friends. Our Lord did this, and, and these sheep do this as well. Sacrificial lambs who follow the shepherd of their souls, the caretaker of their souls. And he wanted me to add this. And they see me face to face now no 
veil between remains. A bride has yet to come into full union with him and she must still be prepared, cleaned up, straightened out, purified in her odors, her inner conduct, and his friends whom have already married him in covenant fulfilled will assist him in the earth unto the maturation of his bride, for she is not ready yet. So his first of first fruits will come on the scene now, the friends of God, to assist this process. As they will go through the crucible now in great afflictions, refinement, and maturation. His friends lay down their lives, as he did, to the saving of the church and the preparation of his bride to be ready to be received when he comes to fetch her him to himself. But the friend of God, Enoch, Abraham, and the such are a different company altogether. They have already consummated the nuptials, become one with him, and are now the sent ones, as Yeshua was. And they are sent out into the world, into the church, to prepare a people with him to be received of the bridegroom. These abide with God. They are appointed. They continue in covenant established with him and, up, and upheld and forthstanding, meaning remain. They give ear to him, hearken unto him, and understand him. And in this they rejoice greatly because they hear his voice, his disclosure, tone, address, and language, the sound of him. And John says, in them doing this, his joy or cheerful delight is fulfilled. Stating, the goal here is that we decrease in our souls, desires, agendas, reasonings, decision-making, and leading of our lives so that he will increase in us and with us, and we in him and with his presence, approval, fondness, pleasure, and glory upon us. In the fruit of that union, the man-child, mature ones. John 11.11 11, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may awaken him out of sleep. How many of you see one, 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 one a lot? Well, here we can see it has to do with being a friend of God. And not only a friend of God, but one on a mission with God to seek and to save that which is lost in darkness, estranged or perishing, awaking them out of sleep or raising the dead. His friends are going forth in the earth on mission with him to seek and to save, to raise the dead from death to life and into proper relationship with the truth. He's a person and a conduct of the way that's how to live with him, how to abide in him and he and you, and enter into eternal life through upholding the truth and authenticity in one's life, as well as abiding on that path of conduct, the conduct of God, and by his leadership resurrected in our souls, our conscious and deciding man. One is the number of unity. Four is the number for created or recreated. So four ones equals recreated in unity with God. Four ones, one, one, one plus one equals Father, Son, Holy Spirit plus you who are in full unity again. This is the friend of God and the goal or vision of God. Oneness, a full circle come back around in the garden of the souls of men. James 2, 23. And the scripture was fulfilled, which said, Abraham believed, which was had faith in him with respect to his person, credited him, entrusted him with his spiritual well-being and committed to God. And it was imputed or inventoried and estimated, reasoned, reckoned, and supposed unto him for righteousness, which is equity of character and actions justified in such. And he was called the friend of God. If one believes God, which means he has faith in him with respect to his person, credits him on all accounts and in all things, entrusting your entrusts your life to him, entrusting your life to him. Whoops. Got to have your fingers on the right spot. In your spiritual well-being and is committed to God, that's a consummate relationship with the truth, his ways and eternal life. Then it will be counted to you, estimated in those actions and affections toward God, in obedience and reverence that you walk righteously before God. Meaning, you walk in like same manner in your character and actions of as God walks, and you are justified in this walk of righteousness, obedience, reverence, and authenticity of person. These are his friends. And likewise, if we remain carnal and in the natural mind, which is not in trust toward the spirit, for it is not walking with God in spiritual spaces, places, and cannot be, for it is opposed of living in the spirit. It is living as in, it is living in as a human in dirt places with the minding of dirt, 
earthly ways, the carnal nature of fallenness, fallen away from walking spiritually with our creator, the Holy One, and it is enemy of God or opposition to him. It sits in doubts. It sits in reasons within itself of ways that God is not to be trusted or believed. It searches for proof in the world through human senses and knows not the ways of the spirit because it still reigns inside a man as most highly regarded voice not the voice of the unseen God. It is the person, conduct, and voice of doubt in God. And, and they reside in the place of darkness or estrangement with another leader who is not God holy, true, and loving. So when one couples with God's enemy, they are a friend to the world the spirit thereof. They are not saved nor set free, and he desires for none to perish in estrangement, being an enemy or one in opposition to the truth, which fights against it in doubt, unbelief, fear, and pride. A friend of God believes in his goodness and is seated within it or him. James 4.4, 4, you adulterers and adulteresses, you men and women who do not believe and walk in darkness with fear, doubt, unbelief, and pride that separates them from full freedom in Christ held in bondage even yet. And he wanted me to add that. Do you not know that friendship to the world is enmity or hostile in opposition with God? Therefore, whoever will be friend or friendly of the world or the spirit thereof is the enemy, active, actively hostile as an adversary, Satan of God. We can sugarcoat it. We can grieve over who the people are because we know and love them, but so does the Lord. And he states that if you are walking as the spirit of this world darkened inside as it is run by its rhetoric, thinking and the spirits that give that counsel because your flesh is still in charge and you know not your true identity nor or do not walk in it in full faith of God, his identity and your security in him, walking paths of righteousness with him. You are his hostile opponent, his adversary. No trust or surrender to him in the truth. And you stand in opposition to the truth and the person of. For within you still your soul, your carnally minded, natural minded, not the mind of Christ, is still in control. And you have not surrendered or believed on him properly. This is a Satan, it's a title, and is the reason his united ones, his mature ones, have need to help him prepare his people to be received, for they are still in great estrangement, darkness, oppression of the devil, and held in bondage. They, these are they, the deliverers of Christ with Christ, and who walk in his name and authority, the man-child mature servants of the Lord, whom he calls friend, who were called, chosen, and glorified in due time. Revelation 12, 6. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. There are first fruits of union, a company of people who are to bring forth produce fruits of God in their lives with proofs of who are coming forth out of the church, the woman. But the woman herself, the church in full, they are not ripe yet. They are not mature yet, but some are the first of the first fruits. The first of those in whom God has been able to mature into the stature of Christ erect within them. Yes, sir. He said, please put the full stature of Christ. As they have bowed all the way down, resumed his image, and bring honor to the king of righteous truth. Exodus twenty two twenty nine, Thou shalt not delay to offer the first of your ripe fruits, and of your liquors or juice. The firstborn of your sons you shall give unto me. The woman is the church, and they are travailing to bring forth, which means travailing to become mature, a man-child birthed within them. These come out of this church group or body of Christ, whom Christ has been able to fully mature into his stature, and they will rule with God because God rules within them fully. These are they who have come out of the church, who have been refined, stripped down to the bone structure of God, serve him and his interest in the earth, uphold the truth and paths of righteousness, laid down their lives and poured out their souls unto death so he can live in them and through them. 
these decreased so that he could increase in his dominion, presence, and glory within them. This church body or woman will bring forth, come into maturity as a man-child company, separated out from the rest of the church or body. And as soon as she does, the devil will try to destroy the fully mature ones, the man-child company, but he will be unable, as it will be Christ in them, and he defeated them already. See, the reason we have to become mature, we have an adversary who seeks to destroy us, steal our true identity, and kill us off this planet altogether. Mature ones will battle with him directly. The child, the man-child mature one, was caught up to God and his throne. This is taking place within each mature one now inside, and then it will come to fruition here in the earth as well. For all things done in the spirit realm eventually bleed into this realm where all we sow in the spirit, we reap in this realm and reality. The mature ones, those who birthed this man-child, this product of maturation in Christ, his full stature, will be caught up to the throne, the place of his dominion, to stand before him and be recommissioned to bring in the harvest of the last days and to mature his bride, the woman, the church for him, preparing a people of the Lord for his receiving of them. And the woman, the church, the body fled into the wilderness, the place to be proved where she had a place prepared of God that they, the man child, the spirits the sp and the spirits of heaven should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Revelation 12, 12 through 17. And when the dragon saw that he was cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman, his church bride-to-be, who is coming into maturity, which brought forth the man-child. She brought forth some into maturity already, first of first fruits. And to the woman, the church body bride-to-be, were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished or strengthened, convolution which means reformed reshaped through torturous winding or twisting stiffened resolute fattened and cherished for a time and times and a half time from the face of the serpent or the malicious satan he said please highlight this the malicious satan because that's what it says in there under the serpent so if god is taking the church into the wilderness that, that she, she's going to give her wings to do this, which means he's going to provide her the way to come into this place where she can be nourished, which really means strengthened and reformed, reshaped through torturous winding or twisting. That's that's mal taking his hands and and making you into a different shape completely inside, stiffened or resolute, fattened and cherished. For a time, times and have to from the face of the serpent, from the malicious Satan, that means all of the ways of darkness. So he's planning to eradicate that in the wilderness. And that's what he's been doing with this man-child company already. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, the church body to be bride, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood or overwhelmed by the river. And the earth, the solid soil, and these are Strong's definitions, helped the woman church, body, bride-to-be, and the earth, the solid soil, opened up her mouth or her language and relation and swallowed up or devoured the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth language or and relation. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, the church body, the church or body, bride-to-be, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, the remaining ones who were the sown seed, offspring, and remnant of his planting, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The dragon will never prevail over the man-child. It would only be, as Christ demonstrated, a laying down of one's life that could ever end up in the death of the man-child company persons. If he asks us to, we would and will lay down our dirt suits. But it is the church, the immature or maturing company of the body of Christ that the dragon comes after, who flees into the wilderness for her maturation process, where the first of the first fruits and the angelic with them will nourish, reprove, and raise up into maturity the church body or bride-to-be. He will try to overwhelm the immature in the church body of the bride-to-be with his torrent coming at them. But those who endure to the end shall be saved. He promised us this. 
The solid soil ones, the man-child mature ones, will help the woman, the church body, the bride-to-be, and the mature ones will open their mouths, their language, the truth wielded as a sword, for they are in relationship with Messiah, the King of Kings, and will swallow up or devour the flood of the mouth-running torrent that the enemy, the dragon, will cast forth from him in his language and relationship to darkness and death. Darkness will be swallowed up by the light, death swallowed up by life, removing the veil. And it will come forth from the mouths of the mature ones, those in solid soil. Remember the soil types? Gardens with the Lord, their souls. Isaiah 25, 6 through 7. And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the lees, well refined. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering, the veil cast over all people, and the veil that is spread over all nations. And so the dragon will be wroth with the church or body or bride to be and will attempt war with the remnant of her seed. Her seed is who she produces and she produces the man child, the offspring of the Lord God himself, the remaining ones of his planting. They are those who keep the commandments and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Have the testimony of Jesus Christ. It means they are like same as him. They walk the walk, talk the talk, died to soulish self, born of the carnal nature, carry the soulish self that's born of the carnal nature. They carry his seed in them and it remained and produced the fruit of that union with him. They are his duplicate seedlings who remain with him and he with them abiding together. Those are they with the testimony of Christ erected within them. They are those who have died in all ways and Christ now lives in them. You see, it is not something said that is a testimony. It is something lived and only Christ could live his own testimony. And these are they who have his testimony and his person alive in them, witnessing to the world that Christ lives and he lives and does the works of the Father in his people. These are they, the mature man-child company of the Lord, the firstborn of the firstborn of many brethren or family. Unite with God now, couple with him now, and come into all his ways, all his truth, his, identi his true identity and yours in covenant marriage, union with him, and produce the fruit of that union, a man-child, and help the Lord bring in the harvest and the maturation of his bride. For that is a special position in the Lord's house and a special place with him forevermore by his side. The bride are those who will yoke to him, but are men, but many are immature yet. The friends are wed to him as well, but they have already done so in coming into full maturity with him and have fruits meet of repentance to show forth of this union. And now he has chosen his friends to help him mature his people. So they are ready to be received when it is time. And this is a word from the Lord. Quote. Friends, he tells me, are few and far between them for me, Janet. I seek to have many more as I have, as I gave myself a friend to many, fully embracing them and laying down my life. This is how you come into the same close position that I have with the Father. When you embrace me, die the soulish death poured out unto death to my truth, my person, my ways, and conduct in obedience and reverence to me and my leadership of you in this realm. It is oneness, Janet. I call many, but few friends are chosen. Few will die the death to be used in this world to the saving of souls, bringing them out of darkness of sin, estrangement, and into the glorious unity of the children of God. Unity. One, 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 plus one. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit, plus you. That equals oneness with God. Few step into this with me, for few are seeking to be as I am. I desired for all to do this with me, but only some chose me back and chose to lay down their lives so I could take one up with them and in them we will see my friends come on the scene soon dear for i have need of mature ones to help me pull the rest from the fire saving some through holy fire refinement and alignment those who have wed me already in this realm will now carry forth the truth of their identity in my realm into this realm this is the glory of the lord on them in them and with them Redeemed, resurrected, and glorified, the mature man-child company of holy priests of the Lord and the high priest, Yeshua HaMashiach, me, Jesus the Christ. Much is about to take place, and I will set in place my devout ones, my humble ones, my meek disciples will take the world spirit by storm. The light will devour the darkness where they are. Safe havens will be established in grossly dark hours, and where the spirit of the Lord is with them, freedom will reign. 
I am the God who delivers and I will. But many will come through fire as my man child company already has. They were refined willingly for they desired to be as I am and to come forth, but to serve all with me. Religion will go to the grave and relationship will take over. Antichrist will fight against the spirit of Christ, but Christ has already overcome darkness and mine will do the same, crushing it wherever they go as they introduce me to the world and the lost. Go forth, little ones, at the deployment of a tiny but mighty nation. I will call you up soon and bring you forth in your recommission to take on the world's spirit of darkness, lies, deception, and obscuring of the light, the truth, and the way of life. Listen to Neville Johnson's video that she linked above. It will explain more. I call my friends out into the battle with me, and we are coming for darkness wherever it be. And the glorious light, power, truth, and love of God shall prevail over the grossest of darkness, and many shall be saved pulled from the fires of destruction and brought forth into salvation. Those who have come through this with me themselves will assist and lead the others through the same path. I am the God who delivers and comes to oppose darkness, and so do my people. And they are the friends of God, and you will know who they are very soon. End quote. And he signed it, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ, ruling high king of the realms and leader of a mighty, humble, and resolute army of friends. The manifest sons of God are one with him in spirit. They are the friends of God, the sent ones. They prepare the way of the Lord, the man-child company. And that is what he has asked me to bring forth today, folks. It's a very different understanding of the friend of God than anyone has ever said to me. And it was Neville Johnson who woke me to this as he spoke things forth in that video. And then I went back with the Lord and I sat with him and I said, wow, I don't think when we look at the wedding banquet that we realize who the friends of the bridegroom are. Yes, bride, to be a bride is to unite with God, but many of them. Many of them are waiting to do that fully on the other side, which means to come into their full refinement even on the other side. To wed him there, they're still veiled. There's a separation, Father, between them. And you tore the veil down, but yet there's still a veil. But there are some that you united with face to face, no veil, no nothing. And you did it way back when. All the way from Moses and Abraham and Enoch and the rest. There were a people that you have always had access to who there was no veil between you face to face. These are the friends of God. And they lay their lives down as you, the man who laid his life down for his friends, right? The one who came in a dirt suit, who rocked it out perfectly to give us back unity to God and reconciliation to the truth, the way, and eternal life. So, the friends of God, the holy ones, the purified, the set apart, the ones who are pure in their hearts toward you and your purposes in this life, the holy Melchizedek priesthood would do this. They've already wed you. There is no veil between your face and countenance nor theirs. There is no separation between them, and they seek nothing but to serve you and the brethren, and they will help nourish, reprove, and bring into maturation the rest of your bride-to-be, who you have said is filthy and wrinkly in her conduct right now. They will be servants who help you wash their feet and scrub their garments to prepare them to be married to you as well. That is the friends of God. And what a beautiful description you have brought forth, Father. I thank you immensely for this, as I have wondered many times why my heart was attached to the friends of God, and I didn't understand. And I know that you're still bringing me into truth, and I know that you'll continue to reprove me where I didn't get things properly or quite right, right? I'm willing to do that because I want to come into the truth in all your ways. I want to understand you, like you said, these understand God, his voice, who he is. We have the ability to do that. Father, may you, may you establish more friends now, since we know what that is now, to seek not only just to be the bride of Christ, not one who just unites to God, but 
one who becomes as like same as God conducts himself toward everyone. To be one with God. That's the dream. Because not every spouse that marries another are they friends, deep friends. It ought to be. It should be. That is that is the example you've given. All marriages in this realm should represent what it is in true union between God and man. That's what it's for. Walk it out now between each other. Love them as I have loved you. Right? Husbands, give your lives, lay them down as Christ gave his life for the church. And wives, love your husbands as if they're Christ themselves. How are we loving him? Because he gave everything and laid his life down, becoming our friend. A dear one, a fond one. That is a friend of God. That is incredible to know. I don't want to just be someone married to him who isn't deeply and fondly in love with him. Honoring his person and has returned to his ways in every possible way that I can. Looking like him again, screened, cleaned up, scrubbed, and purified in a consecrated life to him. That's a friend of God. He's a priest. His friends are purified priests who go to the altar to make sacrifice. That is the friend of God. They have married him already. There's no veil that stands between one countenance of God to the countenance of man. They're face to face in union. And that is who will nourish, along with the angelic he sends, the woman or the church, the bride to be who is still veiled in the wilderness to bring her forth through her maturation process, too. And Father, I thank you for this word. And I, I, just bless, bless, bless your soul, bless your spirit, bless your person, God. I am so delighted right now in, in the revelation of this. It is profound to me. And it has absolutely taken me to a deeper level of understanding what friendship really is. Really. As we discussed a little bit earlier, that actually a truly set apart one the real purified church, the truly set apart ones, they will not walk in witchcraft. They will not walk in works of the flesh because they have become one with God. So those who walk in works of flesh have still yet not become one with God. And we're all in process, Father, but I'm talking that's the goal. The goal is pure on friendship with God where we have returned countenance for countenance, image for image, mirror reflected, refined in the refiner's fire until the face of God is seen in us. That, that will walk clean and not in fleshly ways. That kind of person. That's your dream. It's truly our dream. If we really get to the heart of it, will we pay the cost? Father, I pray many will pay the cost. I pray many will do the work within themselves and work out their salvation to come into union with you and to walk in the newly created man. We have the ability to do that, to walk in our true identity as the newly created man who knows our God. We know in whom we have believed and am persuaded is able to do all things. That is the friend of God. And I pray many more will step into this and do the work. Cast down the devil. It's amazing when you cast down a devil, when you cast down their rhetoric inside of you, there's freedom literally floods your body when you come out of all those agreements. You come out of your faith misplaced, thinking the enemy and the kingdom of darkness is so strong. They're not. They're actually already defeated, <laughs> quite literally. So if you'll come into the truth of all of that, the truth of his identity, the truth of his position, high above all principality and power, and in and abiding with you and delighting for you to become one with him where he can actually indwell your vessel, which means fully come in there and kick out everything that is not an operation of him. You want to, you want, you want to be fully dwelled by God? Ask him to do that and make yourself resolute that anything that he does not do, does not walk and does not talk in, does not conduct himself like you will eradicate. You will be indwelled by him if that's what you choose and that's what you will work to put your effort into. Many will never step into that in this lifetime, he says. Many are unwilling to pay the cost. You have to walk in bravery, which is in the face of fear. You do the right thing because you know in whom you have believed and am persuaded is able, period. You have a spirit of love and of power and you are sound minded in him. 
You will do battle with fear. You will do battle with doubt. You will do battle with unbelief and pride of every kind, which is really to make choices for yourself and make excuses to walk opposite of him. The ones who will be the friends of God, who will walk and do great exploits with him, they will be ones who deal with the darkness within them in every place that he points it out. And then they will go and do darkness battles in the earth onto the salvation of others and unto what is best for them. How they will be then set free in the same way. They will go to do battle with the darkness wherever it is and in whomever it is. Because they, as the Lord wished for none to perish, but that all would repent from their wicked ways. You have to repent, first of all, that you're in affiliation in any way, shape, or form in ways that God is not. And then fight to uphold the truth. See, you can cast out demons. We can cast out demons. We can clean a house out immediately. We can stand in dominion and tell them to leave right now, but they're going to come back if somebody doesn't know how they got in to begin with, which is an affiliation with ways that God does not conduct himself. That has to be eradicated inside of a man. And if he says, I'm not this, then you believe him and you go up against the darkness with God. You go up against fear. Fear is his en enemy, his nemesis. It's his opposition. So if we're going to be fearful, we're standing with his enemy against who his identity is and his power and rank of authority. And that's why people can't get set free because you fundamentally have to uphold who he is and his rank and authority, which is his name. And if you can't do that, then the enemy of darkness, your faith has been placed in them and the kingdom will remain in you, which is all their attributes. And they're very fearful. They, tr they, they shake and tremble at the name of the Lord. That's what you're feeling. So the truth has to be erected. And Father, I thank you because your shining ones, your bright ones, your glorified and resurrected ones are soon to come and be caught up with you and recommissioned, transfigured and recommissioned and put forth in this earth to help you, to assist you in the maturation of the woman who will go through great tribulation. You will bring them through. They've got to mature. They got to come through the teething process being weaned off of milk and on to meat to grow up that the whole the whole point of that is to grow up into being spiritual beings and not carnally minded not natural minded anymore not making room or giving space for any kind of lies or deception no untruths we have to walk in the truth and we have to be rooted and grounded in mercy which is love love and truth that's what they're coming forth for. And I thank you for that. I thank you for the brilliance of the first of your fruits that have matured to help the others. Because the first of your very first fruit, Yeshua HaMashiach, that came into this world to show us how all sins ought to operate with the Father and under the brethren, you will bring them forth. Because they are the first duplicates of you who will bring in the maturation of the rest of the woman in the wilderness. They will have plowed a roughshod path for them to understand this is the way you have to come through. We can't do it for them. We can lead them. We can set them free. We can cast demons out, but they will have to become disciplined ones as every one of us to keep their house clean. Because if you don't keep your house clean and locked in with the truth, locking out the lies, they will come back and they will come back worse with seven more. We have to walk in our true identity and his true identity, life in Christ Jesus and Christ Jesus living in our lives. We have to do this. Or you will not overcome the darkness and you will remain in bondage. And only you and he together can do it. I can assist you. I can help you. I can help you scrub your garments. I can teach you. I can bring you sustenance and food. You will have to take that food into yourself and you will have to let it remain in you. You will have to keep the truth in you and you will have to worship and honor and uphold him. You will have to do that. But if you will do that, you can be set free. And Father, I thank you for your sent ones who will come forth with you in this hour to do just that, to help set the captives free, to mend the broken hearts, to bring good tidings to the meek, to open the prison gates, remove the shackles, open the blind eyes, open the deaf ears, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That, that is what I'm excited for. And I thank you for this revelation today, Father. And I thank you, Yeshua HaMashiach, for all you have done to pave the way to be reunited with the Father once again, which is to be reunited with the truth and let it be rooted and grounded in us, the truth and love. And that you continue to still walk this out, shedding the Holy Spirit abroad to everyone as they come through the cross and go through the crucible, 
they will step into eternal life and freedom into the glorious liberty of the children of God too. And without you, none of that could have been possible. May we all become friends of God.